Okay. Okay. We're ready to go? Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Careful that the cables don't. Okay. Maybe you could. So, welcome. I'll uh, make a brief introduction and also explain to the audience here um, the setup for today's uh, opening seminar of the Brunel Performance Research Seminar Series. We are broadcasting live, so uh, camera can go on roll and tape rolling. We are connected to the outside world, and they know we're starting the series today with a very distinguished guest. And um, I welcome both our local audiences here, research community students, staff, as well as those who've come from other departments, always welcome, yeah, as well as our audience uh, online. And it's a great pleasure, my name is Johannes Biringer, to introduce uh, our first guest in this autumn series, uh, Scott De La Hanta. Uh, Scott and I go back for quite a few years, almost now 20, mm -hmm. and he's a dancer originally from the United States, but uh, spends much of his time now in Europe, as well as traveling to many locations. He's been a pioneer uh, and instigator and really a provocateur in the field of dance research. So coming from practice background, he moved, I guess, in the 90s into a more curatorial role of um, facilitating, organizing, planning, conceptualizing, and then directing research projects, workshops, yeah, special events. And then recently, I think, um, uh, I remember, of course, the choreography and cognition project. Before that, software tools for dancers and choreographers. Before that, yeah, you were one of the initial uh, forces behind bringing the dance practitioners closer to uh, uh, an intimate understanding of um, the new media technologies. And he was one of the first people to organize dance technology think tanks and conferences. And then I think the choreography and cognition project indicated to me that you are, in a sense, going far beyond maybe the initial involvement with dance into uh, connections to science research and into bridging into other disciplines. And uh, lately he has been monitoring and supervising and coordinating four, how do you do this at the same time, four research projects yeah, in different countries. And I think his lecture today will reflect on those, as well as perhaps give us a taste of the new things that are happening in Frankfurt with the Forsyth Company or with the company that you are associated with in London, Wayne McGregor Dance Company. So please join me in welcoming Scott De La Hunter. <laughs> That's the best introduction I've ever had, <laughs> really. I, we know each other for so long. And I was just uh, thinking back to also workshops that we've done together back in the late 90s after we met in uh, conference circumstances in the earlier 90s in Amsterdam. So it's really, and we're good, we're good friends, so it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm, um, I'll just play this. That was the title which Johannes preferred to the other title that I suggested. So chore choreographic uh, traces of physical intelligence uh, was the one he, he preferred, so we kept that one. But what I would like to do is let you watch a few minutes of this piece, One Flat Thing, reproduced by William Forsythe, which is one of the, um, it's one of the projects the publishing projects that we worked on. And when I say publishing projects, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a recent, not a recent, yeah, a relatively recent conception of mine that these things that I've been working on are, are publishing projects. And they're publishing choreographic ideas. So the title that I had suggested was Publishing Choreographic Ideas, uh, Discourses from Practice. And I'm, I'm going to try and persuade you somehow today, to, you know, in the next 30, 40 minutes, um, to follow me on a certain line of thinking about what I might mean by that. And, I'm, and then I'm very keen to have a discussion about it, to hear your views as well on where, wh whether you think this, um, this conception has some of the potential that I think it might have for practice, especially in, day in these days when we are um, 
developing new ideas about practice-based research and what that might mean for, 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 for real, well, I say real artistic practice. So you get my bias. Um, I'm, I'm, um, um, so this piece was used in a project called Synchronous Objects, uh, one five thing reproduced, uh, which is a, what we was originally conceived of as an online score project and that I'm now kind of repositioning as a publication project. So to get into this area of publication, I'm going to leave that PowerPoint presentation behind. I'm going to slide by some work we're doing with Jonathan and Matteo without getting into it in a moment. And I'm going to jump over here. And I am going to apologize. I'm going to jump around quite a bit between different presentations to try to pull out some things. Johannes is pointing. Am I working? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. So what might I mean by uh, publishing of choreographic ideas? I am thinking that in the last several years, more and more publications have emerged from the dance field, from choreographers who've, who've, who wish to communicate um, their obsessions, their, their, their ideas. They wish to reflect on those ideas. Maybe it's they would wish to communicate something about their creative process. Maybe they wish to communicate something about the context within they w which they work. And they've begun publishing these materials um, in a way themselves and in collaboration with other publication teams. And so within this uh, collection of material, I would put Jonathan's relatively new book, A Choreographer's Handbook, which is text only. In fact, if you read the introduction, he, he um, avoids using any images at all for the explicit reason he feels the images would predispose you to thinking in certain ways about his ideas. Now that's interesting given some of the really imagistic, heavily visualized things I'm going to show you. So you see the range of, the kind of range of space that I think these things uh, currently reside in. Now I don't really think this is a fixed category. There's no reason it should ever remain so. It's just a temporary clustering, a kind of center of gravity, which has been bothering me, I mean in the best sense, kind of bugging me for a while and making me think about certain kinds of relationships. These are where Johannes mentioned the four projects we worked on. A, a, an earlier conceptual frame for this was choreographic objects. The idea is that these were objects being produced. And that still works, but I'm trying to shift it a little bit towards this idea of publication because then I can embrace the books and things that other people are doing and the fact that they're disseminated widely on the internet or via other, other channels uh, for dissemination and distribution. Capturing Intention is one of the projects Johannes mentioned in the Constellation of Four, which is a <laughs> uh, Constellation of Four projects with Emmy Greco and Peter Skolton in Amsterdam. And I'll show you a little bit of that. And Bill Forsyth has this just out of curiosity to get, get a sense. How many are, don't have to raise hands. I'm assuming that people are, some people are familiar with the CD-ROM. Nodding is great. Raising hands is always a bit awkward, so it's, nodding's good. Deborah Hayes' books, she's published more than one, two or three. So Deborah herself as a practitioner, and she's been very explicit that she's published in order to help audiences l read her work. She, uh, she felt that already she felt that her work could use some additional uh, ancillary information in a sense um, to help people understand it. And she's published more than one book. This was an earlier one, The Story of a Dance. Steve Paxson's recently produced a fabulous, uh, a DV which I should have brought with me, but I'll show you some things, um, DVD. Meg Stewart's book, Are We Here Yet? In the introduction, Jeroen Peters writes, and he's the editor for this, uh, he speculates also about an intrinsic discourse coming from practice that is somehow um, 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 represented by these initiatives on the part of the choreographer. So something about talking about process. Meg's book is very much about the context of her works. There's quite a few visual images, but in the center are a whole collection, a fantastic collection of scores and instructions and games, improvisations, just right in the center, printed in different colored paper. And um, in a way, I pick up on Jeroen's notion of an intrinsic discourse coming from practice. So this is the kind of collection that I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, Now, if we were to take that further back, so 
and we'll start someplace else. Um, what, where is this coming from? Where's the intrinsic discourse? What, where's it coming from? I mean, how, obviously, I'm being, I would be interested in how it is that it captures something of the um, experience, something of the physical dimension of performance practice. And a while ago, I collected a number of, um, I looked for uh, drawings by choreographers. And they weren't so easy to find. They're still not so easy to find because it's not unusual that the choreographers, Alex <laughs> laughed, we were just talking about drawings and his, his desire not to see any of his drawings published. <laughs> but um, we, um, because normally the notebook is very private, could be very private, part of process. But I found a number of things and I put them in different categories just as a way of teasing out some of the implications for a practice of inscribing something on the page that's in some way related to your experience moving, your experience exploring movement or choreographic structures. And this is a drawing. Um, there are a series of these drawings published in Contact Quarterly. Contact Quarterly is normally not um, in the considered, it's not a peer review journal, for example. So it's, it's, it's normally slightly outside the academic frame. But it is one of the journals that consistently publishes process, information about process. Um, and these were published in there some years ago. Remy Charlip, who died recently, uh, had, and as I, 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 uh, as I understood the story, he had been dancing with Merce Cunningham and injured his back um, and stopped dancing and then proceeded to uh, heal himself through a process of some process of introspection, one might assume, partly because of the nature of the drawings here. As he began to explore his somatic, much more sort of alternative approaches to, to somatic awareness and things, and he produced a number of these kinds of drawings. These drawings in the somatic field are not unusual. You'll find a lot of people drawing Barbara Clark, for example, a number of people who will be drawing, um, uh, often with arrows, pointing lines of direction that, in other words, you would be trying to experience some sort of directionality in your own body through this, what's indicated here on these drawings. And these are, these are things he's just suggesting you could experiment with while standing. Now, what I want to try to draw you into imagining, this is a work of the imagination that we're, uh, I'm trying to do myself and want to try to draw you into, is that these are drawings that help Remy himself Let's say, let's imagine the early drawings. These just didn't emerge without any other, any other sketching, any other exploring. These are probably kind of final drawings. You know, he decided that's good, I like that. I'll publish this. But earlier on, there were other sketches. What did those sketches help him do? It helped him understand something about his own experience. It helped him, um, it helped him study and contemplate things that his were, were in some way part of his somatic awareness. And you could speculate the extent to which he then discovered more things on the basis that he was drawing. So this is clearly one of my um, planks, you could say, is that by drawing and exploring relationship with the page, a practitioner of movement can understand more things. They can study things as a result of doing that. Um, the, the other thing then is to wonder about this page, is how would you best understand this information as a piece of as a piece of uh, text, as a, as a drawing, as a description. Let's call it a description, not text. It's a form of description. How would you best understand it? The best way you understand it is to do it. In other words, just to read it flat on the page. You can leave it there if you wish, or you can, you can, you can do it. Now, we're do it's, this isn't an exercise in doing these things right now, but you, I think you get the direction I'm kind of going. The page is coupled to the body. The page is an extension of one's own understanding of, of one's... Uh, what one is trying to discover, the kinds of what problems one is trying to solve in movement. And that movement can be internal, and that's what these indicate, is a kind of internal movement. So that's one drawing. A second kind of drawing, and I'll move a little faster through these. Dana, Dana writes, um, does something, a, a number of these drawings, I don't really know their history or their provenance, you could say, in her, in her terms. But she, um, she's described these, I've only seen a few of these, but as more like uh, calligraphy. So these are drawings that capture movement directly to the page. So that's, in other words, they're a little bit different than working out a relationship, more to kind of cognitive, something structuring the body's uh, uh, connecting points through its kind of skeletal drawing. This is really trying to capture something on the page. And she said it helped her understand the temporal 
uh, uh, nature of her choreographic practice. So it wasn't – so immediately say, well, it's not about – it's clearly not a space mark. It's something about a time mark. So it ag – and again, seeing this, this is a, um, not, not quite the same as Remy's. But in other words, to understand this, my proposal is that you need to somehow imagine her moving expression that left the mark on the page. So this is another work of the imagination. She's not there. Uh, you may never meet her. But the idea is that, you, is that you can somehow look at it as an inscription of movement on the page. It is not inert. It has to be alive somehow. These are fun. These are really choreographic drawings. These are more from notebooks. Uh, Simone Forti. Now, these are the ones that might be secret. They may not be the kinds of things you open up. They're just you working out some kind of relationship in the space. You're making plans. You know, the slant board goes there. You're sketching things. Maybe you share this with your collaborators. But it's another kind of drawing. And it does help you work out – again, it helps you work out problems. So um, the implication is that this is sort of coupled to the performance. I mean, once the performance is sort of figured out and you remember everything, you don't necessarily need it. You might return to it or it may never be returned to. That's quite possible. But it still at one point was a, a concrete temporal register of a, a set of relationships that were very present to you. I'm assuming fast speaking English is okay because if it's over – should I speak a little more slowly? No, I'm just looking at the back. Okay. I like these drawings, also Simone Forti. This then brings in the question of the eye. This brings in the question of what's being seen. Simone Forti investigated animal movement. She's well known for that. It's well documented. And, and, and it did extraordinary things to, 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 to her, her facility with movement. So. What I think this captures so nicely is what she paid attention to. As this is a, clearly an elephant, but she didn't write, she didn't draw the whole elephant. But it's not an abstract elephant. You could say, well, it's a kind of, it's not an abstract elephant. It's actually it captures the thing she was looking at at the time. She thought something was important, and she captured it like that on the page. So it's a register of her own uh, what it is that she's paying attention to, what it is she thought was valuable. And I think this, this is also interesting to bring in the eye in a way, it, to bring in the seeing eye as part of the body, but as a way of – so the page here is a sort of register of the things. It's recording, documenting things that she thought were important to maybe return to. We'd have to probe her, ask, ask her to know it, more or less what she was doing with this. But I think it's possible to speculate that this, these marks are helping her um, – understand something and maybe mark or emphasize the things that she thought were important. So thinking about keeping the eye in mind, um, this is the work of a notation artist, a lot of notation artists. And a lot of the projects I'm, gonna sh I'm going to show you don't really work a lot with uh, existing notation systems. And it, even the artists involved sometimes even say they're not sufficient for what they need. Now, that's not necessarily true, but it's the claim the artist says, I need to invent something more. I somehow think that the sort of ongoing constant invention of movement notation systems is almost kind of human. <laughs> there have been you know, dozens and dozens made for many, many years. And at, every, at many junctures, you know, that's the one everybody's using, and then it moves on. Currently, though, Banesh and Laban and Eskel Vachman are used, and they are very comprehensive. Laban is extremely comprehensive. I don't actually know why anybody would want to do <laughs> another really comprehensive notation system as long as this exists if you wish to use it. But the point is not so much about that. The point is this is also about the eye. The really wonderful thing about a trained notator, I believe, is, is that they, are, they have such a capacity to notice things and choose things that are of importance under certain conditions. So presumably they're working in a space where they're being asked to record that work for posterity or they're being asked to record um, or material during the making process. And with all of the uh, skills that they've developed, a sort of kind of expertise with notation, how is it that they see things, they notice, and then they record? So these notebooks are not the finished sort of printed uh, Laban scores you might, might see eventually printed out by a computer or something like that, but are the record of a hand moving on top of the page. And the last score, which brings us a little bit closer to something else, the last kind of drawing, are, are drawings like this one. This is fairly well known by um, uh, Trisha Brown. If you're familiar at all with Trisha Brown, you'll certainly know it. Um, 
And this goes a little further with the notion of a, a kind of inscription of something, a description of something, which exists as a drawing, as you see it. But it's the connotation is that the drawing itself is the um, um, it's it's the dancers who imagine that drawing when they're doing the score. So again, you have to put in a way in order to understand the score, you have to you have to impose on it your belief and your kind of in your imagination the dancers are actually working with it. Um, they have to imagine those points in space around them. And they're given simple instructions about what to do with those different points in a sequence of numbers which are um, just translated from letters. So you can have a, a meaningful a sentence of some kind, translate the letters to the, the sequence uh, number in the sequence of, of the alphabet, and that gives you a sequence of points to do various things with. Point towards, look towards, jump towards, um, kick towards. There's a little list of instructions that Trisha Brown gave. And in the earliest performances, um, there are a couple of images from early, perfor early performances in the 70s. And there, I read an interview, and I can't for the life of me find where it is anymore, but it, uh, it, it quoted Trisha Brown as saying, she didn't care so much about what movements they made, they, she wanted to see the cube. Now, what I find interesting about that is that, and other choreographers have begun to say things like that, they prefer to see the dancers thinking or making decisions. It doesn't matter so much where the movements are, they prefer to see, in a way they, prefer to, they would rather see where the attention is moving in the space. So the implication is what they wish to see is beyond just the shape of the body. And she wanted to see the cube. Um, and that's going to come up a few more times. So, and this, is a, this drawing captures, in a way, that, that thinking process, that process of attention. This is a drawing about attention. This is, a, this is an indication of the kind of the ways in which the dancers are paying attention and thinking about certain relations as they're moving. So they have to be thinking in order to uh, perform the work. Uh, we'll just stay on that track because the next thing in that track, okay, so then I'm hoping to uh, slide into some of the work that we've been doing with this as a background. But uh, you see the sort of obsession with seeing the body in intimately somehow coupled with, with uh, forms of description through drawings. But what if your forms of description take on uh, if you decide to explore what you might do with media? So this, most of you said you're familiar with, is the um, – a small clip from uh, Bill Forsyth's Improvisation Technologies CD-ROM, um, responding in a way, what you see at the top is a question he had, which is in the small booklet um, interview with him. If you're dancing, how do you actually say what, what happened? And one of my uh, proposals for most of these other projects I'm going to start showing you is they often responded to a question the artists themselves have about, the nat about their work. So that these are also coming out of not only a desire to communicate ideas, but a, a desire to reflect on one's process. So publishing for oneself as, a, as well as publishing for others. And this movement you see now here is like this. And that's parallel, but folding like this is called shear. Yeah? And the shear are when these two lines that are parallel fold like this and maintain the relationship. And you can get, maintain, for example, very commonly the relationship between the thighs and the forearm, yeah? And you can maintain a kind of parallelity, yeah? With attraction and repulsion between four different lengths, yeah? Well, so that's, in a way, this is not, this, this drawing, of course, is drawn on top of the video after uh, he's, later on, after the recording's done. But the combination of the drawing, so we've looked at drawings before, the drawing, the, the articulation, the theory, the small description, and the movement communicates that idea as an idea. And remember, I th I'm interested in publishing, the, uh, the notion of publishing choreographic ideas. It communicates it very clearly as a kind of, as what I would think of as a choreographic idea. So it makes it very explicit what that idea is. Um, it's interesting that this was originally done for his own company because the company, um, rather than for a wider audience. So one could speculate that because he was wanted to communicate these ideas very clearly to other dancers, it, 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 it's been done at a fairly um, – he didn't feel that he had had to explain or give more context for it. 
uh, it could be the one reason it works so well is that he did know that he wanted to communicate to other people who are moving. So he, one could speculate about that. The next project attempts to do something different based on the idea that this was – the general feeling that this was a very successful technique, this simply drawing lines on top of video. So what's happening here? You're, he, the lines are drawing your attention to where his attention is in his body. So he's, he's, he's describing to you the general – the naming of the thing, what its name. And there's, a, there's just a lot of information packed into one simple sort of um, um, demonstration, a lecture of that idea. And if you, if you, if you look at the CD-ROM, there are about 65 little lectures like that. Most of them use that same simple technique. And you can jump to the studio. It's not on this. This is just a, a, a video of that one section. You can jump to studio examples where the dancers are working as well. And if it would serve us later to go back to some of those, we could do it. Um, but on the basis that inspired by what happened subsequently, uh, that was developed for the dancers in the company to, to share those ideas with them initially, so with them. Subsequently, I think just general interest in it, it and he was collaborating with ZKM, this very large media arts center in Karlsruhe. They decided to publish it more widely, and now it's in its third printing and available on Amazon. So it moved from a, more of an internal project to a very public project. But it was inspired a number of these other projects that I, uh, that I may mention uh, later. Um, and I think it was generally considered very um, uh, successfully communicating those kinds of ideas to a wide public. He wanted to um, use some of the same techniques with a finished work of art because that improvisation technologies is just um, trying to communicate ideas about moving uh, relationships in the body, things that might one might do oneself in the performance, but not really communicating per a structure of performance. So the next project, I don't know how many are familiar with this website. Um, if you, it's down here, synchronous objects. You should certainly go look. Actually, we have a super fast internet connection, so we could always go there if that makes sense. Um, using the same kind of idea, drawing lines on top of video to, to, to draw your attention to the, the, na the kind of attention that's happening in the space. This piece, you saw a little bit of it at the beginning. Uh, it's about 17 minutes long, and there are about 17, 16, 17 dancers. And it's all set choreography, so there's very little improvisation, sometimes little imp movements of improvisation. And um, they just, Bill, f Bill said, this is, I feel that we can uh, communicate the structures in this dance. People don't see the structure, it's, it, but it's, it's there. And I wish to help audiences look at it and find it when they, when they um, come to the show. And it's true. When you go to the One Flight Thing Reproduce, the whole, you might have seen a bit of it there. But um, um, the movement clusters up in one corner and then stuff sparks out over here. You have the feeling that it's extremely coherent. Uh, in its structure, but you couldn't necessarily identify what the structure was. It's all in counterpoint, so there are things happening, at, um, you know, there's no synchrony. It's all happening at the same time. But nevertheless, your eye is being dragged around the room into different, different areas. And that's based on um, the queuing system they felt was very important to try to communicate how the queuing system was working, how the system of alignments in space, so different things happening in different, uh, different parts of the space that could be seen to be in some kind of alignment. So that's not necessarily two arms, but it might be an arm and a head. And you saw these little indications here. I don't know if that will play again. Yeah. That might be alignment, for example. Up and down, those even alignments can even be in opposition. So there are lots of things that could be alignments that he tries to draw your attention to. And also movement uh, thematic material. And the score, when you go to the website, these are all the dancers here. And once they've analyzed the material in order to produce the, the visualizations, there's also enough information to produce a wide range of other representations. And this is interesting from the point of view of these publishing ideas because once you've got the data, once you've got the information, um, which is a little bit different from the, the drawings that we were looking at, once you've got the data, you can re-render those relationships in different visual form. And, um, and, and also share those. And the, the idea is that those visual forms sometimes can help you see structure that you may not have been able to see as easily uh, from a different perspective. And that perspective might be in the live performance perspective. So it gives you the possibility to study the work um, 
and spend more time with it. So here, a couple of the questions um, that uh, Bill uh, proposed for this project. Remember, the other project had a question. How can we teach audiences to see complex choreographic organization? That's what I mentioned already. And the other is, what else can this dance look like? And I've also mentioned that in this notion of kind of re-rendering the dance in other form. And I'll show you what the annotations on the queuing system look like. So when you go to the website, you'll find these sections. I mean, it, it, you, you get a sense that the whole, and you do get a sense when you're watching it, is that the, it, a kind of level of organization which helps you see the whole, the whole thing as a kind of organism, partly because of the aesthetics of the line. I mean, these lines, these are, these are hand-drawn. These aren't, there's no automated computer program running here. These are actually sketched on top by, pixel by pixel, by animation artists. It's the same with the other one. But it's really Bill, Bill I think, felt that that, init that first one was successful in communicating those ideas, and he really felt that he could use the same kind of technique, it's just annotation on top of video, to give you access to the structures in uh, the choreographic structures and the organization of this piece one flat thing reproduced. Okay. Back to a drawing, just for fun in a way. But how do how do how is it that we this is now Slightly, we're moving way beyond just a single person drawing on top of uh, drawing drawing into a notebook. We're really into a fairly extensive project. This was a very on, on, a, on a you know a scale of magnitude bigger than than uh, one's own interaction with one's notebook. This involved uh, the Ohio State University Advanced Computing for Center for Art and Design and a fair amount of funding. Uh, but it's inter it's I've always it's interesting it's. Um, it has to start someplace. So it has to start with the company communicating how the work, um, the, the uh, structure of the work, the, when the cues are happening, uh, where, where, they, where the alignments are happening, uh, spending a lot of time with the animators and the um, designers. And that period of the process is another one that sometimes we try to extend and get. In the current projects I'm doing, we're trying to get more information out of that period of time when the dancers are working directly with the designers. Now. I think, rather than keep going in that direction, because that was something else, that it might be, I talked about rendering, a couple of things that are rendering, here we go. And we can easily go to the website and look at these if you're interested. But remember this idea that once you analyze the system, you've got data. In fact, the thing I ignored back there was a spreadsheet. You saw the spreadsheet after the drawing. So in that spreadsheet is all the data for um, what is then um, re-rendered in different uh, visual um, examples of the piece. So here's another kind of rendering, which you'd seen uh, scrolling on the bottom. And another rendering might be something like, like this. If you go to the website, you can. Um, this functions as a tool. It's interactive. You can change the sliders here. You can change the playback speed. You can look at that queuing system um, under kind of a – see you later, Sue. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, you can look at that queuing system under other conditions. That's the whole idea. It allows you to study it. I think one of the things that um, inspires, inspires me and inspires my colleagues working on this is the idea that you can produce – back to the notion of objects, but you can produce things that people can study. You can produce things that come from a dance practice that people can study and return to and look at over and over again. And, um, and normally in the practice, in a live art practice, something that's considered to be ephemeral, it's hard to study dance at, 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 that, at, that, at that level. You've got videos and things, but these are objects which the choreographers themselves are saying, study this, you know, study these relationships. This is what I think is important, so study these. So that's another way of re-rendering those. And if you go to the website, which we could if, if you want to later, you'll find that there's a whole bunch of information starting from the dance. And it does, it, it's intended to, to kind of dramaturgy across the page where it starts with looking directly at the figures dancing and the annotations to more abstract re-renderings of the data from the dance 
to even more, um, not abstract re-renderings, but these are other disciplines who took that data and rendered meaningful objects within their own discipline. This is a statistician. This is a geographer. This is an architect. So this is, Johannes was mentioning this, uh, when w one of the really exciting things about these publications is how they can inspire other disciplines to turn their attention and their interest toward choreographic practice, dance practice. Even if they're, they may not be drawn to it as an art form, but when they're given access to some of the underlying, it as, a, as information, as, as ideas, they have a, there can be a different uh, engagement. That may, ev that may evolve into an art project, it might evolve into a science project. Uh, in any case, the, the collaboration usually produces some sort of uh, you know, interesting and productive friction and new understanding that can be drawn back into the field. Right, let's see now. Now I'm jumping around. Now I'm jumping around. I think that kind of lays the basic um, ground for what I'm interested in sharing with you in terms of publishing, this notion of publishing choreographic ideas. So we've talked about some sort of fundamental coupling between the, the, make, the choreographer, the mover, and the, the idea of the other forms of description that could be considered part of publications. We've looked at um, very visual examples uh, with Bill Forsyth, who took a progress, a progress from the improvisation technology CD to a more extensive project. Um, and I think if some of your questions I can respond to quite quickly with other examples from other choreographers. But what I'll do now is show you what we're doing with Deborah Hay in, uh, in, in, in uh, Frankfurt. Because she presents, and the reason we're working with her under, in Frankfurt, which is within the frame of Bill's company, is that she's completely different from Bill as, a, as a, well, I should be, it's not entirely true. But in other words, the, the, the marking, one of our aims was to work with choreographers who have very different um, processes. They're not Bill. And we're working with Deborah Hay and Jonathan Burroughs and a couple of others uh, in the States and um, Thomas Howard as well, who's Swiss, German. Um, and Deborah presented a very different kind of um, challenge for us in terms of publishing her uh, choreographic ideas. And I'm going to go there and then open it up for, let me see here. Uh, let's go here. Let's go here. Let's close that. Let's close that. Let's jump in here. Okay. Start here. So, I don't know who you're f if you're familiar, but it, a brief sketch is that Deborah's, Deborah, Deborah's about 72, 73. Johannes knows her well. And she's been, I, I mean, I think um, slowly, evo well, not, you know, for evolving for over, it's got to be 40 years, um, uh, a, a very, very uh, rich choreographic practice. She's been based in Austin for mo much of that time, and now she's moving around doing what she calls a solo commissioning project. She danced with Merce Cunningham initially, and that experience, and she's, she's explicit about it, that experience uh, um, sent her rush, running out of the studio uh, to Vermont, out of New York, to eventually to Vermont. But if you look at the Judson Church period, you'll find her. She was uh, um, uh, working during that period of time. And um, she, she um, and I'll, the one thing, uh, she, she has evolved a practice which is very precise. The choreographic work, and she would say, this is a choreographic work. No Time to Fly, it has a score, is a choreographic, uh, is absolutely a piece of choreography. It's not improvisation. But um, um, the choreography remains the same, but the movement might change each time it's performed. We worked with um, three dancers who know her process, and so they were able to take the score and render their own adaptation of the dance. Um, and then uh, they came to Frankfurt and were filmed as part of our, the Motion Bank project, which is similar to synchronous objects. Our aim is to put that material online. Inside Deborah's, you get a taste of the kind of complexity, especially in language, of her, of her score. This is about 20 pages, a small booklet. But to, there are different types, almost classes of, of information in the score. There are tools, and these are things that Deborah says she uses whenever she needs them. And I think I'm always, I'm always really aware if she were here, what I'm paraphrasing things that she says, and she's very precise with her language. But, um, and I'll play a little clip for you in a moment. Um, but the tools, uh, 
her choreography is based on the dancers and her ability to be present, is present in the moment isn't actually adequate somehow. It's that she knows exactly what she's doing at any moment in time. In fact, the dance has a sequence, so she knows eventually she'll be over there. At in, in, in the sequence, she would have arrived over there. But the way she arrives there has to have a certain quality of attention to it. And she's very clear about the, nat the kind of nature of that, the quality of that attention. And if she loses some of that, if she feels she needs it, she refers to and relies on things like the tool. And the tools themselves are, if you read it, it's, it's complex. What if how I see while I'm dancing is a means by which movement arises without looking for it? So, uh, and this isn't something, it's not something she's like a mantra rehearsing. These are just kind of conceptual ideas that she, she studies and understands and works with. She has images, so actually there are images in the, in the but in certain ways of working with images. She has, she has choreographic instructions, but I appear at the edge of the stage is the limit to it. It doesn't say which edge, it doesn't say at, at what point, but at the edge of the stage. And then the note, things like notes, as I said earlier, the movement may change, but the choreography itself doesn't change. And I'm going to, and the other thing I think for our work, which is very um, important and something I am still working out, is Deborah's conception of her own uh, body. And you'll get a little bit of it here. This is her explaining to the score team, the designers the, uh, and the, uh, the digital artists, how she works. For 40 years, I've been, when I'm dancing, I reconfigure my body, I reconfigure my body into the cellular body. When I started doing this in 1970, there were five million cells in the body. That was the number. Here it is, 2011, and the number is now something like 384 trillion cells. So it's a, I, I'm pretending to 380 trillion cells or more at once. I'm noticing them, and I can't do it. It's impossible. It's such a huge task. I can't possibly do it. So I'm devoted to the feedback that I get when I notice, when I just, when I reconfigure my, my body, then thanks for it, but it's limited in what it can do. So I'm not interested in what it can do. I'm interested in how I can raise the threshold of my attention and energy when I break it down to the cellular body. I think what thinking about this idea of the, the notion of publishing choreographic ideas, so that, that something the artists wish to express, when somebody's con conception of their own phys their own body is so precise, and this has been very consistent, and she's tweaked it, but the cellular body is fundamental. So one of the things we'll be trying to do is to um, produce, some, produce some ideas about structures in her work, but we need to ground it somehow in this discourse that's, that's intrinsic to her practice. And the great thing about working with Deborah is that this course is quite evolved. It's very, it's very concrete. Um, and I think this, um, it, gives us a, it gives us a kind of anchor in terms of trying to explore what this intrinsic discourse might, might be. I think we can do it very, very, um, um, very clearly here. I think this, this notion, it may be worth mentioning that um, a number of these projects involve, um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Susan Melrose and she has this notion of signature artists. And these, pro these projects all tend to involve people, Bill, um, Wayne McGregor, Emmy Greco, um, Deborah Hay, Jonathan Burroughs. But I think it, one of the things we, we're interested in doing is bringing some of the tools and methods for documenting and analyzing and reflecting on one's practice to a wide range of practitioners across age and, 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 and ability and experience. But in the moment, this building of, of a kind of um, uh, the discourse which comes from these practitioners seems to have potential that to give us some momentum 
in this area, if that makes sense. In other words, that's it, there, and that's another reason to try to get as many involved as possible. And there are more getting involved. So how do you solve the problem of Deborah's, um, the variability that you're, is going to be inherent in the structure of her work? Because she's already said, um, you know, the specific time and place, you know, the piece was not set to be performed at the same time in the same place every night, which is what Bill's piece, One Flat Thing Reproduced, was shot, a single shot, was considered the definitive um, shot that was then analyzed. So you have to figure out a way to look at the many versions. This is Janine Durning, one of the dancers, starting at the edge of the space. So it, it won't, maybe it won't surprise you that, the, that we, had to, we had to come up with a concept for recording her material. So we know that any one single version, w it won't be the fixed version, it can't be the fixed version, but we have to create some sort of uh, space within which we can look um, across many versions for p patterns and similarities. And so what we did is we filmed the three solos of the three dancers um, seven times each and then an th additional three times in the autumn. So we have nine different recordings. And we can look at them exact in a way. This is a visualization. This is an early visualization of that relationship. This is all six versions layered one on top of the other. And you can see, I think you can see that actually um, this is the same section of movement material. You see some similarity in the movement material, but she's obviously performing it in uh, at different time scales. So she may end this section later or earlier on any one, one run and in different spaces. We know there's a sequence, so we know there's a structure. This is the sequence of the dance. So we can mark at each, um, we can mark for each version the point at which each section begins for each dance. So we start to see some um, our data, remember the data for synchronous objects was in the spreadsheet, which was taken from the queuing system and the alignments. Our data is going to be taken from the point at which they begin each section and also from their pathways. We took, uh, we filmed from these two corner angles and we also filmed from the front. The, ver the version you've just seen are the, is the front camera. The two angles here were given to some computer science people and they used an algorithm to extract the pathway in the space. Not the whole skeleton, but just the, the pathway. So that you, you get a representation like this. And once you have the pathway, you can get a single snapshot of that particular run in the space and a, a way of re-rendering that so you can look at it from different angles and you can study it. Well, just studying a single pathway is not going to do us any good because we know that that's not going to give us a feeling for the structures in Deb's work. So we have to explore something. We have to explore something else now. And what I'll show you are just a very, very early um, stage of trying to – one thing you can do is you can lay – this is 21 different solos all laid on top of each other to get a sense of where what this is called the heat map because you see well it's obvious what you see is that this is the pathway so these are all the pathways laid on top of each other now before we showed it to Deborah we said w if we were to if you were to make a guess where your dancer spent you know more time in the space than uh, then uh, she said she said well I my instructions um, uh, are that they shouldn't spend, there's no one sacred point in the space. 
um, and that and that and that it should be even distribution. I mean, the nature of the nature of the instructions. I think now that I've talked about it enough, you might you might you might um, understand how this could be with her instructions. Is that there should be no space that they gravitate to if they did several performances. She, she expected a more even distribution. It's not entirely surprising that it's downstage a little bit in the center. Um, now. And when I say not entirely surprising, this is slightly ben this is not an un this is not an, a massive um, 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 new understanding of that work, but I just show it to you to give you some sense of what we're beginning to do, which is to layer many performances on top of the other. To also we're also able to slide timelines along each other, so we can look at the beginnings of different pieces. We can also snap out segments, so we can snap out segments. Let's say this is the curve. This is. Um, we can snap out a, the curved path. I, uh, the curved path, I think, is the third in the sequence. So we can snap out just the curved path for the different dancers. This Janine, Roz, and Juliet. So one thing you can look at immediately is a kind of signature. Again, not, not surprising that a dancer would have a signature, but it's, it's captured in the path for the specific dancer, and it's made abstract. And what we intend to be able to, what we, what we can do, easily do, is to, um, layer that information, and then I'm going to, I'm, I'm wrapping up this part of the talk, just to show you what that might look like. So, go back here, bring this down. Okay, this is, um, this are, this are, these are Roz's curved paths, and you're going to see Roz executing the curved paths here. I'm going to slide her forward a little bit so that you should be able to trace that first one on the left, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, et cetera, the fifth one. Now, that's in a way that gives you an indication of where we have another a close-up shot as well. So you could, you could be studying these different pathways. You could be thinking about the signature of the different dancers. You've got an abstract view. So, you know, this notion of re-rendering that information at other levels of abstraction. And because everything's synchronized, you could click any point in this path and go immediately to this view. So if you wish to study where she was at any point, you could just click on these lines and go to directly to that view. And you could also click on the line and go directly to a close-up, so you get a much better impression of what she was doing uh, uh, um, at, a, at a closer range, much closer range. So this idea of going in, be able to go deeper into the dance and back out to an abstract level is, I think, going to be crucial to what we're able to provide in terms of interaction with the information online. We're not anywhere near that yet. These are just initial sketches that, because we've now synchronized everything and we've analyzed everything, so we're actually able to do this. And I think that that, really wraps up, I don't know if it's, you know, we've, we went from drawings, we're coming back up to some sort of inscription, some sort of drawings, almost small, some, you know, kind of some kind of odd iconography that relates to the pathways in space. Um, there are more of these kinds of things. So here's another indication. This is holy site, Indian chant. So these can be pulled out and immediately you get a sense of very, very different signature from the dances, dancers. And this is, this is um, what's been important for our work with Deborah is that this is information she'd never seen before. She'd never seen this kind of aggregate because we're able, we're able to aggregate the information into kind of cluster it together into clumps. And it really gives her an opportunity to think about it in ways she hadn't thought about it before. And that's one of our main aims is to give her, remember I mentioned self-publishing, a kind of a tool for reflecting on her own work, uh, as well as communicating <coughs> how one might think about the structures of her work uh, when they're seeing it. And I think I'm going to stop there because it's um, at five and uh, um, take questions or discussions or debates or arguments or... Thank you, Scott. <coughs> Let's give him a hand. Yeah. It's a great pleasure, and um, I just want to make a brief comment because um, of 
you're referring to Deborah, I just mentioned it to my to my MA students uh, that she uh, has been a mentor, a teacher of mine, my only dance teacher in a sense, that I ever took classes from way back in Texas. And she just performed on Saturday with uh, a few friends of mine in uh, Houston, Texas, in the context of uh, a huge exhibition at the Menil Collection dedicated to John Cage. And the exhibition is called Silence. And Deborah and uh, six other uh, performers were uh, presenting a work, which I thought was unusual because it had a choreography, uh -huh. but the movement can change because they were not dancing themselves, uh -huh. but planning to conduct the visiting audience into certain kind of movement experiences inside an empty space. Ah, and uh, yeah, so in a way she was going to work directly with uh, uh, the, the stimuli she can give to the audience to move themselves. And um, uh, all the power to her because she is indeed in her 70s and you heard her speak. It's tremendous for me to see how you and, and your colleagues are looking at um, some of these choreographers uh, who may also get uh, to some extent forgotten. Uh, Deborah always was very remote in a way from the New York scene. Yeah. She decided to live in Austin and that she in fact did publish and that she's now part of the Motion Bank, to me that's, that's incredible. So we open the floor for questions. Also, one more comment, we have students also from other departments. Um, for example, for music, I would be interested in hearing questions also addressing the kind of tools or reinscriptions and how they, for example, relate to work that might involve the voice or, or music or, or even theatrical practices. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether you've worked with theater people, but please feel free to ask any question and we'll pass the mic around so that you'll be on camera, yeah? <laughs> um, the, the sort of dance that we're seeing is dance that seems to be suited to certain kinds of visualizations and as you said uh, visualizations that assist us in reflecting um, but then uh, sort of counter to that perhaps there's dance that's more perhaps in the realm of affect and physical danger, I, I'm thinking of Elizabeth Streb, for example, yep. um, where um, it's, 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 it's a different kind of relationship to space and, and mass and, and time. Yep. And there's, there's a real kind of, in other words, the danger of this kind of dance for me is that it's not dangerous in the sense that um, in reflecting, uh, perhaps we're not focusing on the actual physical act of, of the movement itself. So, so in visualization, you know, the problem is that it becomes, in a sense, an abstract realm of choreography, of, of signatures, yeah. um, and then you lose the kind of real kind of physical aspect to, to space and, and time. And yeah. I think um, um, I'm glad you mentioned Elizabeth because she, this is my list of publications coming from, you know, this publication list and she's here, Streb, How to Become an Extreme Action Hero. That's her book. I think one of the, um, you're absolutely right. I have no, you know, I think that's an interesting, we happen to be working with Deborah and also Jonathan with some, uh, uh, quite analytically. And I'm very happy with that. I think we're going to get some interesting results. But I think Steve Pacton's DVD, Steve's, they chose not to take such an analytic approach, but to find visual techniques for filming Steve's body um, on, for example, glass. So it's him rolling on glass, and you can see the pressure points. And it's just very concrete what's, what's going on as he talks. 
So I think what's important about you know, th thinking of this as an accumulation and, and, and acknowledging that we need to look further for techniques for capturing what we can capture, also acknowledging we can't – there's some things we won't be able to record because that puts us in the realm of kind of uh, speculation and technology fetishment, fetish you know, that motion capture can – use motion capture. That will get every, you know, kind of everything. So I kind of like the fact that we can't capture everything. But nevertheless, some practitioners here, um, like Steve, and then it, if I worked with Elizabeth, because I saw her last year, I would focus on her machines, the building of her machines, as the as the layer, as the deep choreographic structuring information, is in the building of the machines. That might not get the, the that that to me would unlock some of the ideas that she has that include then the bodies. But I'm glad you mentioned her. She's she's a fan. I'm a fan, big fan. Um, great, thank you. That's so interesting. Um, just picking up on what you're saying, Stella. I mean, I think there are things that are always going to be missing. Um, but in terms of dramaturgy and composition, I think these are such amazing tools. And I sort of um, kind of asserted. Well, I proposed possibly a couple of years ago at a conference on it was real working a set of working practices on dramaturgy that we weren't very good in theatre at um, documenting composition. That in fact music was was way ahead of us and probably dance as well, even through lab and notation and things like that. And it strikes me that already this is, you know, this is something that if we were to kind of try to move it across to theatre would be so interesting because we're always being, you know, everything's always usurped by the text and the words. But in yeah, fact, yeah. it's that looking at patterns. And I think as a dramaturgical tool, there's, there's so much potential in there. And I agree so like, that there's always going to I mean the effect is always going to be gone um, in many ways in, in documentation and in, and in a version of something because it's always a version of something. But, but actually, as a, as, as a tool amongst many other things, um, I, I, it would be so fascinating then to see what would happen with various different theatre practices and what that would reveal too. So it's, it's really more a comment if you have any ideas about anybody looking at theatre or moving this across or where it might go at the moment. Yeah, that's a good, good, good. Uh, I mean, some of the people there are there are. Um, Goat Island was very good at producing mm. process yeah. publications. Yeah. I have to. I mean, I I, I I've stayed close to dance pra dance practices i'm very interested in training the training that's there and underpinning you know what the movement practice um, but as you know i said earlier this this container won't last long in other words it's just a current obsession publishing choreographic ideas it's it's going to fall apart at some point and other things will come in i hope and i hope we've we've developed some methods and doc that people would go ah that's an interesting way of approaching that problem deborah's a problem how did they approach it? Ah, they did it kind of like this. Maybe we can use that. But working with GOAT or any of the devising companies, because clearly that's where movement is essential and, and, and spatial, you know, all kinds of relationships, would be, would be, would be very interesting. Yeah, terrific. Thank you. Sure. Um, just to follow along again on Stellock's point, um, uh, with the thing that I, I mainly noticed with, um, with the stuff uh, for synchronous objects was that it's it's a lot of you know sort of spindly lines and really thin lines and the similar thing with the movement paths later with Deborah Hay's work so a lot of the, the very linear you know tracing the line of the body which um, doesn't exactly capture weight and I think yeah. that the the idea of weight was really missing but then when you presented the the drawing earlier um, that um, that looked the like calligraphy. Yeah. That really does, uh, you know, it's sort of this idea that that's like a kind of time mark, but I also think it's a mark of pressure because yeah. you can see the difference, the distinction between, you know, if they push the brush in this yeah. way or that way. So I wondered if the you'd found any sort of adaptations of technology to capture weight and mass and um, and pressure. Interesting. Um, I mentioned uh, 3D motion. Ca I, I dissed, dissed 3D motion capture a little mm -hmm. earlier. I said, you know, it's not going to get everything. Nevertheless, it's an extraordinary technology, and it can definitely get. Um, I mean, if you have the means, you can set up a capture situation to get a lot of information about weight and dynamics. And they're doing that at Ohio State University mm -hmm. with the choreographers they work with there. So, in terms of capturing some of those dimensions, um, um, 
technically at the level of data, I think they're going to be exploring that. And their interest, they reduce their interest. You know, we're looking at, I mean, it's, it's real, the decision we decided to go with 21 versions of Deborah's solo gave us so much video material to process. You know, the work, the scale of work became really huge. So we've sort of stayed at that level of, of abstracting structure away from these many versions. But um, OSU has decided to look at the relationship between two people. So they're working with choreographers who specialize in duets. Mm. And, the, and there, they're very, you know, I think we may get some sense of the, you know, a kind of a, a different di um, property of the corporeal in that information. But the one thing we're doing with, with Deborah's work is one of the designers is a 3D animator. And he's been building just, um, just a 3D uh, worlds, a visual, very rich visual worlds, which for him is his own adaptation of the score. And all I'm, what we're kind of hoping is that something between the analytic, highly analytic view that you see here, and something between the look and feel of the site, you know, the stuff that he's got some very gluey things going on that we may me be able to fool, in a way, seduce people into uh, a relation with Deborah's material, mm. which where they feel that there's more substance there than you catch just in the lines. And I also think going deeper, I said you can go to uh, that one camera view that you saw most with the dancers, but then there's a deeper one. You get the whole body moving, you know, with the facial expressions. So you might be able to get in a little closer. Mm. But... Yeah, I, I um, yeah, who knows for, yeah. I mean, one of the comments I've had frequently about synchronous objects is that, that it's very hard to find Bill there. If you go to the website, you find a lot of abstract, then you get that, that abstract, then you get the re-renderings, then you get the, what the other disciplines are doing, then you get other tools, then you get digital media objects. And people have said, well, it would be useful for them if they heard more from the, the, the maker mm -hmm. somehow, that it would ground something. I like the fact that it, it goes this way quite quickly somehow, just to, just to do something different. But I think with Deborah, that's one reason I showed her talking about the cellular body. We, we need more of her voice. We need her describing things. We need her uh, language there to, to give it some. Scott, we have a question from our online audience. <coughs> I read to you. This is from uh, Yevgenia. And she says, as far as I understand, your methods allow notating in space-time dimensions mostly. For example, structure, perhaps also dynamics, etc. What about emotional expression and meaning? Yeah, it's a similar answer somehow. We're, we'll, um, we'll, you know, we, ch we chose with, with um, uh, Deborah to... Um, develop some uh, 3D animations, which we think might have more, um, might give the impression of more sensations, more, more um, uh, in relation to the abstract uh, information, the more abstract information. But we're not, we have to see how that, how that goes as we go along. We didn't attempt to capture anything. In fact, one of the things we discovered working with kind of discovered with Jonathan and Matteo, and this I hope uh, Yevgenia helps you, help, helps you a little bit, is that um, you actually have, you have to make decisions about the data collection. I mean, you, you, you have to say, well, we can't capture that. We, we're not going to capture that. We're going to focus on this element. We're going to focus on that element. Um, and with Jonathan and Matteo, they, for example, said, um, we're looking at instances of counterpoint across all of their duet work. So now there's seven and just occurrences of counterpoint in the work. And we, so we've got about, we've recorded about 25 fragments. And we're looking at those fragments, analyzing those fragments, and we're going to try to look, at, look for patterns as well. And one of the things that they initially said is, in fact, for us to really, for the counterpoint that we, 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 gives our, we give ourselves such, um, uh, when the audience is in the space, it's when we feel that we perform best. Well, to make it simple, that sort of. And therefore, maybe when we record, we should have the audience in the space. And slowly, the recording conception became one of more like a theater space, more like what you'd normally expect. And the, 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 the artists, the media artists, were, you know, already had a different... They, and I think they'd, they were quite, quite good in that situation because it was, we're negotiating between the artists trying to just make a decision about what we could capture. And the decision was to um, actually create a clean 
equally artificial space. The, the theater space, uh, a filming space is, is artificial. This is a data collection space in a way. And we've reduced it. You saw the, I don't know if the, online you can see it, but this was their, this is their capture space. So no audience, in fact, no sets, just a very clean background and two of these 3D Connect cameras in front. So we made a decision as a, as a, as a, as a group, to, and along with them, that we would actually do it in this very lab-like environment, very spare, with none of the normal what you expect in a, in a theater, because we're actually not trying to analyze that part of their performance. We're trying to look for other kinds of structures that they're also interested in. Don't know if that helps. Hmm. Uh, if I can follow up, uh, may I? <laughs> to come back to the to music, no, uh, Scott, there was a moment when you were showing us um, the large palette of tools in the choreographic objects uh, project, and you referred to some of the collaborators involved in it. And um, I remember uh, seeing one of the programmers at a at a conference talking about it, and he showed some of the tools. Mm. And you mentioned the architect or the person perhaps interested in geographical, topological models. Yeah. Now, what I think I remember the architect, he's also from Ohio. Yeah. What, what interested him about the tables, for example? So if you think about, let's say, the furniture or the objects in space, you could also think about the sound and, and the way that's uh, perhaps, uh, uh, to some extent, always a part of how the dance is developing over time in, in time, yeah? Mm -hmm. Although Forsyth doesn't often talk about the sound. But the furniture architect, what did he do with the material? or What tool did he uh, contribute for the project? Or was he someone interested in looking at the, sp the scenography of the dance? The, um, about the, mu the music, just briefly, because you mentioned it a couple of times, uh, with Jonathan Mateo, um, their sonic, their, their musical space it consists of, of things they say, because they're often speaking, but also, you know, there's claps, there's slaps, there's stamps, it's, it's tremendously rich, the acoustic um, phenomenon, and, very, and extremely varied, and very precise, and very much part of their choreography. So you might not be surprised to hear we've taped, we've recorded everything. You know, we've got mics because actually the sonic phenomenon, the sonic phenomenon, you can analyze a lot in, in the, in the, uh, using computers. So we've really taken that into account. We've got a lot of recordings of Debra's as well. But Jonathan Mateo's, I hope that when we finish, uh, I'm assuming that you'll get a lot of that on the website, that a lot of the sort of the relationships and structures have a lot to do with their kind of the, the sonic domain the music domain. Um, the, you've asked me the question about the architects, and I, because I was a, more of an advisor on the project, I don't remember so much the, um, the uh, conversations of the architects, other than they, the one thing, in other words, they chose the tables themselves, those tables in synchronous objects, as, as um, important um, features that they wanted to analyze. So in a funny way, they didn't work with the data from the structuring, the queuing system, and the, and the, and the um, alignments and things like that. They chose another uh, point of entry into the work. They really chose the tables and the relationship to the tables, so all of the movements that were happening on top of the tables. But the one thing that I, um, I don't think, I don't really have this, this, this is a notation system they developed, which you can't, I won't download it, it's really, really huge. But they said that they, they arrived at the point of the objects, they built the objects, and the, and the, um, the notation system is back-propagated. In other words, they made it up backwards. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's, not, maybe it's not such a big deal, in other words, but I think, I think it's really interesting to think that they had to build the things themselves, and then the, whole, you know, the ways in which the notation system that they then um, uh, made, which looks like they made the notation system first and then they produced the objects, was sort of made afterwards as they worked their way back through and they filled in, um, they filled in what the notation system could be, which I think is not a bad way of thinking about how, you know, you know the iterative way in which we build these things is very much producing something, we have no idea what it is, we spend time with it, and then we, ah, we understand something, we can go back in and fill this bit of information, and then we go forward another, another step. It's constantly like this. 
And we absolutely have no idea what the thing will look like at the end. Um, I'm, that doesn't reflect a lot on your, that doesn't answer your question really because I don't really know. But I, this, um, this PDF is quite fantastic if you're interested in, in, if you like notations and drawings like I do, this is a great PDF. Yes. Kind of after you've gathered all this information and analyzed all these patterns and relationships, what do you envisage doing with them afterwards? Um, Anything, or is it just kind of information that people can draw from? Or? Well, what we're doing, uh, the one thing we're doing now, uh, um, you know, if you imagine that these are, these, are, these are initiated by the choreographers or the artists themselves, so they have something they wish to, wish to communicate. The same with Emmy and Peter, Steve. They've, and and they, um, you know, so so there's a broader public that they're imagining. When Bill, when he made synchronous objects, we asked him, "What is your what's your?" What the designers especially were quite concerned that he had no concrete user group, and he because he said the audience should be as many people as possible. Um, but what we're doing with the Motion Bank project is that we have education partners. So at the same time that we're developing the material, like Deborah's, we're working with um, education partners in dance to develop applications of those tools in, in the dance context. And what we, did, um, what we did recently is, because Deborah's is in process, with some people in Frankfurt, we took synchronous objects, so the website, we took... Um, Anna Teresa de, de Kiersmacher just published a book with four DVDs, which is fantastic. The DVDs had no fancy, there's no graphic annotation on the DVDs. It's just her and a blackboard responding to questions from an interviewer where she writes down her structures and demonstrates. So that's an even step back from Bill's demonstration, nevertheless using things, and it's very effective. Um, Anna Teresa's... Uh, Steve Paxson's DVD and Jonathan's book. So text only, then DVD, then DVD and text, and then, and then a website. And we had a lab with about eight um, MA dance pedagogy students. And they were given the work of trying to dig down into that material to pull out ideas that they could use in, um, in education context. So we're trying to, besides just sending them out into the world to do whatever they do, we're trying to develop some very concrete um, uh, approaches uh, within the context of a network, so there are also other people doing this. Um, it feels like a slow accrual, you know, kind of slowly building relationships. In some ways, um, you know, this is an attempt to say there's more of this stuff. So as soon as there's more of this stuff, it's like a funny reference space. And as soon as there's a reference space and one idea, one choreographic idea, Bill's idea runs up against Deborah's idea, you get, you know, a third idea emerges. And that, that's really what I think is exciting. I don't know what that idea will be. But if this is a reference space, and it somehow is, and, and this, this is a discourse or descriptions that are intrinsic to practice, I'm imagining a reference space of ideas which are coming really from practice. They're going to butt up against all kinds of other ideas. But I love the, I, I love the possibility that we can, we can make like, a more of these things. So I'm less worried about whether, in, in a way, just trying to make you know, or support more and more to be made, which isn't just happening in Frankfurt. Um, other people are taking initiative and uh, other choreographers are interested in publishing. And then there's theater, maybe, so. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> are you on up? Would you like to ask a question? Um, uh, freshly arrived on our shores, a visiting scholar from Spain, Anna Kunzel. That's right. Thank you. I don't feel like I'm entitled because I got in late. I'm sorry, I got in a terrible traffic jam. It's fascinating. Okay, okay. traffic jam. Um, Scott, <laughs> I know Anna, uh, but we welcome you anyway. Uh, if, if we are wrapping up in a minute or two, I, I would be interested in asking a perhaps more personal question. This year in our series, we might have a big panel discussion next spring on research practices and the way we understand it sometimes in academia, but also maybe for ourselves as, as artists. Um, how, did you, how do you understand your role as a curator or project coordinator? What, what led you to this role and how are you enjoying it as a, as a former dancer or choreographer, this new research role? What, what made you become what you're doing now? <laughs> uh, 
Well, I'm, I'm, I've always been obsessed by create, how people make things. So my, even when I was making things myself, it was an interest in, that was a, a, a driving curiosity. And when I was making things, I organized situations where other people were making things and you could share those ideas. Um, I think I moved to the UK in the early 90s when we met, when you know, practice-based research was gaining some momentum in a way, that discussion about what constitutes research. And, and I then decided to uh, exit art practice myself, which was a clear decision to then become a facilitator or, re or re somebody doing research. And I was lucky enough to form very quick connections with some great makers who were also interested in research, like Wayne. And, and I found, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I like facilitating those connections, and uh, I, I found them, um, and I, I really like publishing these ideas. I, I love being involved in these projects. It was also, as you know, we met when we were looking at media relationships between media and dance. And you see, and that initially was quite a wide lens. I was looking, I mean, Stellark's work was kind of, you know, interactive stage work and things, um, internet-based performances. That was all stuff I was looking at. And this is, I'm, in a way, I'm back in the studio trying to understand what's happening and then using the, my, you know, these, these, these relationships that I have for many years and, 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 and making stuff that comes out of the studio, which um, uh, can... can that aren't artworks, these are, not, these are not expressly artworks, that they somehow enter into the field as, as uh, publications uh, or as objects, this is the early conception. But I'm, you know, I, I, um, I think it's fantastic that there's tension between, you know, research. I'm, I'm in Germany where the, the discussion about higher education and, and practice-based research, there is very little in a sense and it's highly contested. But that's fascinating. In Holland also, the universities and the, and the art schools, they're separate. But still those discussions are, ha are taking place. And one reason they're separate is that people don't, they're not quite sure they want to jump on the bandwagon, but I'm not so interested in the bandwagon. I just think it's a fascinating opportunity to explore knowledge relationships and to, and to develop uh, new ways of approaching a whole range of different um, practices. And that we're right in the middle of that with, with arts, arts practice, um, which I think is really important. And we need to there is a slight status thing, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm aware that cultural funding shrinking. I mean, it will. It's just, it will. So, but we, so I'm, I would advocate for the fact that these are intellectual practices, that they're, you know, it, uh, that they're producing descriptions that are just as articulate through the combination of media that, that lang you know, verbal linguistic forms are, or they are a form of linguistic expression even. I, but that all, that all means trying to somehow notice the shifts that are happening, um, join them where possible, provoke them, and, um, and aim for you know, a point in time 50 years away from now where you might, might you, you, if, you, if we, you, we wish to impact on the world in 50 years' time with dance practice, what would it take? And I think it takes some, some of this stuff is what it takes. Um, we thank our audience, Ted, and we especially thank uh, Scott De La Hunter for this presentation. You can come up and chat with him afterwards. So thanks a lot, Scott. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's hot in here. So I appreciate your... Everybody stayed pretty awake. Are you in Frankfurt now? Yeah. Well, uh, Berlin. You're in Berlin? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so, I'm living. So what's that like, the state funding and things like that? Well, the funding of theatre and the funding of research? Well, you know, they had this um, Tanzplan in Germany that, the, that there is now a federal cultural foundation. Right. It never used to be. <coughs> and their funding um, is, uh, uh, <coughs> gave a lot of support to dance, and they're funding this project as well. Oh, okay. So it's definitely more than here, that's for sure. And then, um,